Hey, thanks so much, Nick. Really appreciate it. Um, really excited to be a, a part of today. As, uh, as Nick was mentioning, you know, we have looked at various aspects and topics that have been brought about through the course of, uh, of the last sort of 18 plus months of the pandemic. And along with my partner, Ryan Linder from uh, Stagwell, we've been working closely with the CMOs to sort of provide some guidance. What we want to talk about today is a specific aspect of that topic, which is the real global state of mental health and wellness. We've got a brand new survey of 27 nations that I'm gonna share with you briefly, uh, and also look at some of the other data that, that we sort of are gathering, sort of understand and unpack what has really happened uh, with this as a, as a dominant topic, not only in society, but really as a core focus for marketers. And as we get into this, you're gonna see this is a combination of a range of different factors, right? The cultural upheavals of the last uh, two years in society, whether it's on uh, racial inequity, gender inequity, whether it's on political divisiveness. We're also going to see generational shifts driving a lot of these changes, as well as the economic dislocation and the public health aspects uh, that have all been driven by the pandemic. So let's get in and take a look at it. And we'll start first with um, the global leadership and economic anxieties that we are seeing around the world. So again, in brand new data, what we're seeing is that more than four in 10 uh, citizens around the world, this is 27 nations of, of brand new data from this month, actually think their country is on the wrong track. So when we look at the overall aggregate figures, we're seeing sort of 80, uh, 43% uh, disagreeing uh, with that, believing their country is on the wrong track versus right track at 37%. In the states here, it's about four in 10 uh, at 39% saying the wrong track. But just look at some of the aspects of, of the differences across various nations. We're seeing sort of tremendous uh, sort of conservatism, uh, you know, in places like uh, Brazil, uh, in Venezuela, in Turkey, um, even in, in EMEA, a lot of sort of hedging on the fence about whether their country is on the right or wrong track. The, the exceptional standouts here are obviously KSA, uh, Saudi Arabia, you know, rather uh, Turkey, Turkey, not Turkey, but um, China uh, has been, you know, forceful and sort of more optimistic in this respect. But, you know, what really see is it isn't just that part of the story, it's also an aspect of the economy. Now, we saw in our U.S. data a lot of optimism uh, in our Harvard-Harris poll data that we track monthly. The economy was on the rebound earlier in the spring and summer, and as the country here began to reopen in many parts around the world, started to sort of get COVID under control, there was this sense of economic optimism. That's not necessarily the case today. Uh, we are seeing seven in 10 uh, nations, these citizens um, believe that their economies to be weak in their countries. So again, notable exceptions being China, KSA, and UAE. But when you get into Europe and then you work your way into the United States, there's sort of 59% of Americans today believe the economy is weak versus strong. And then look at those numbers on the right-hand side. The further you go into sort of uh, Europe, Southeast Asia, Brazil, Japan, you know, parts of, of, of Latin America, Venezuela, you're seeing sort of this higher degree of sort of uh, economic uh, uncertainty. And then the third sort of triple whammy in this sort of anxiety that we're seeing in our nation data is the sense that the pandemic potentially accelerated another unforeseen sort of malady, which is um, divisiveness. Uh, there was a lot of divisiveness, obviously, in the United States, but now you see most countries feel less united uh, since the pandemic. We asked this question, you know, since before or after COVID, do you feel your community is now less united, more united, or has there been no change? Across the board, globally, um, there's sort of more optimism in some of the countries, again, driven by China, um, KSA, UAE, India, Philippines, and others. But again, as you start to go down that list and you look at uh, parts of Australia, Mexico, uh, EMEA, the uh, United States. United States sits at 37%, almost four in 10 Americans believe that, that the pandemic actually accelerated more divisiveness, that we're less united today, which again is saying something, uh, having come on the, on the heels of what has already been a polarized nation, obviously, in our data. Now, let's look at the U.S. The other aspect that is driving to this sort of anxiety is the COVID obviously returning uh, in large parts of the United States. And we see 
This is our trended fear data. This is work that we've been doing weekly that Nick mentioned, um, sort of tracking a range of different aspects around uh, society with respect to the pandemic. And you can really see that there was a downward slope as we went into the summer months. The, the fear was eroding, but again, we're seeing that creeping back up uh, into the 70s, you know, fear of a new wave, fear of global recessions, fear of returning to public activity. Um, starting to see a slight tick down. Uh, this is brand new data from the past weekend, uh, September 12th. But you can see, even though those ticks are down a little bit, you still got 52% of Americans fearful of losing their job, 48% of Americans fearful of dying still from the pandemic. So with that, you know, that optimism, that thing that we felt, um, it, we asked this simple question. We've been asking this for 18 plus months. Uh, with respect to COVID, do you think the worst is behind us or is it still ahead of us? And you can see uh, on a U.S. basis how those crossed over uh, in July as it became apparent that, that COVID had not left us. And you saw the optimism creep up where the worst ahead of us uh, by uh, sort of the ending part of August uh, reached its high again at 60%. Um, but now that's ticking down a little bit, but still there's more pessimism and then there is optimism, both in the United States and then on a global basis. 56% of those 27 nations believe globally the worst is still ahead of us. You take that all into account, you have this sense of sort of uncertainty, unknowingness, which of course drives a lot of anxiety. So in that context, really what we're talking about now is an understanding on mental health and wellness. And what you're gonna see next is sort of rising saliency and awareness of the topic in society and in business. One of the first things that we see, we ask sort of um, on a monthly basis in our Harvard Harris poll, talking about the most effective or most important issues that affect you, your family, and your community, and which are the most important problems to you personally. Really interesting that mental health and wellness is now a top 20 global challenge across our nation data, this 27 nations that I'm referencing. But then look at it, it's a top 10 issue. It's number nine in the US, number seven in Australia, nine in Brazil, where we saw economic uh, uncertainty there, and even 10th in Canada. So suddenly it's moved from sort of an ancillary issue to sort of a core issue related to societal well-being. Now, what's driving that is clearly the pandemic. Uh, through our COVID tracker data, we've seen that three quarters of parents have said that they could have used more emotional support during the pandemic. Um, equally, 24%, almost a quarter, were diagnosed with a mental illness during the pandemic. And again, that pressure um, data that we have seen in work that we've done with the APA, the American Psychological Association, we saw that incredible statistics here that seven to, to eight out of 10 parents said that they were sleeping more or less than they wanted to. They had unwanted weight changes, they were drinking more alcohol to cope with that stress. And so with that stress brought a lot of pressure that related to their kids. Obviously, clearly, if you're a parent, you were dealing with kids at home, you were trying to deal with the costs associated with that, the juggling of work and home life and school. And then on top of that is this severely concerning issue that parents have about the ongoing effects of virtual learning. Now here in the United States, in New York, we started public school today and kids are back in school, but there's still uncertainty for how long that will be and whether there'll be further disruptions. But again, look at the data, eight to nine uh, out of 10 parents are concerned about the social health, emotional, mental, and academic well-being of how important critical in-person schooling is to them. And then look at on the right-hand side, the potential concern, again, same numbers, very concerning in the, in the green and orange, very difficult to reverse the following issues, loss of learning, loss of social emotional intelligence, the anxiety and depression that comes along with it, and of course, student outcomes and worsening inequality. So with that, one of the particular interesting things that we saw in our, in our mental health and wellness uh, surveys with the Harris Poll was just how an outsized focus on stress it was for young people, uh, particularly Gen Z. Now, this makes a lot of sense. Some of this is data that we've done with the CDC, but we've seen that young people faced this incredible disruption in their academics, in their career planning, in their going to college, 
and really in their future. And maybe I'll just focus on two there in the center. You know, two thirds of Gen Z say the experience of COVID will actually have a long lasting impact on my generation's mental health. And then seven out of 10 of Gen Z younger people don't believe older people really understand the struggles of younger people today. Now with that has come with our data with the APA, a lot of heightened feelings of anxiety, right? So you see, we asked this question, have you during any point during the pandemic felt any of the following? And we can see young, uh, younger people, Gen Z and blue, five out of 10 lacking motivation, nearly five out of 10 depressed or burnt out, lacking a sense of fulfillment, four out of 10 and inability to concentrate. Now what's hopeful in this, and, and this might be one of the most important uh, charts in my brief little talk here, and I think this is a great lesson for all of us as marketers to be thinking about, is that how young people, the younger consumers that are coming into our, into our brands now and, and gaining purchasing power and becoming um, you know, graduates and, and employees and earning their own incomes, look at how they are demystifying the taboos around mental health. They are the by far nearly four out of 10, 37% of Gen Z in our study with the APA report receiving help from mental health professional. Folks, that's twice as many as boomers and Gen X. So what's happening is, it is a sort of a, an easing and opening, a, a sort of a demystifying the taboos around um, seeking mental health and, and a normalization which is driving the success of obviously disruptive brands like Talkspace and the openness with which peers and young people will talk about therapy as a natural thing the way you would talk about exercise or other aspects of your health. So it's incredibly important to understand what younger people are talking about and to learn from them. One of the ways that we did that is a survey most recently that the Harris Poll conducted with Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation an amazing foundation doing some incredible work on the nonprofit basis with young people. And in our survey to try to understand mental health and wellness, we saw some incredible instances where Gen Z are actually leading a movement to fight this stigma. You know, three quarters of them believe that they have noticed and seen actors and musicians and their influencers being more open and talking about mental wellness. 70% are comfortable seeking those resources, again, demystifying the topic, and even getting more support from their family and their friends about talking about that. So this radical openness, this transparency around this critical topic in our society is a really welcome understanding that needs to be understood and can be scaled and amplified uh, by marketers. And it was something we just talked about in the, in the previous discussion, how important the role that brands can play in this place. So briefly, let's finish up and look at um, the wellness imperative, look at some of the policies and trends and disruptors that are sort of existing in this space. The first thing we see is um, really the challenge for business. On the right-hand side, we ask this question to professional workers um, has your company offered any mental health services during the pandemic? Now, among those who are employed, look at that. Nearly half have said, no, my company has not offered any mental health services. So that is a significant swing and a miss right now in corporations, a, a big understanding or at least a disconnect <clears throat> with respect to what workers are seeing and experiencing versus what companies believe they are offering. But on the flip side, the optimistic side, among those who have said yes, 33% noticed new products and services. Um, sorry, 33% have said they have already offered those mental health services. And um, nearly two out of 10, 19% uh, say yes. And these are new offerings because of the pandemic. So that's a top two box you know, of yes. Um, but what's important is that how Gen Z we've been talking about and parents we've been talking about notice and really appreciate these programs even more than other professional workers. Same story on the right-hand side. We asked, did you participate in any of these mental health services your employer offered? And again, we see this, this split where those that said the yes, uh, meaning that they're engaging in these programs at 57%. Again, look at how Gen Z and parents pop at 68 and 60% uh, respectively. So again, the types of programs that employees have noticed have been employee assistant programs at 47%, educational resources, and teledoc resources at 35% each. 
So one of the things I think it's really important here as you think about mental health and wellness is it's not one size fits all. And one of the things that workers really want is just plain and simple better health insurance so they can actually seek out and control their own mental health services. And that's what we see. We see a, a beneficial belief in mental health services. Two thirds of professional workers believe they're beneficial. And on the other side, which of the following do you agree with more when it comes to mental health services? I wish our employer would provide us with 66% better health insurance so I could seek out help on my own. So it's again, it's important to understand it's a very sensitive, very emotional, very personal topic. There are privacy issues involved in this. You can see that in this data. So we have to move into this space with empathy, kindness, compassion, and personalization. So lastly, you know, as we look at the structural change, again, Gen Z, our youngest consumers, are going to lead the way for us. They're telling us that we are an overworked culture. You know, two-thirds of Gen Z said that they've witnessed working parents being overworked by their employer. They're seeing modeling behavior in their parents that they don't necessarily want to replicate. Three quarters of them, and this is from a recent survey uh, that we did with the Meredith Corporation and Harris Poll, three quarters say uh, the quality of life defines success instead of monetary earnings. So again, as companies, understanding our talent, retaining and attracting our talent, we need to open the aperture on what we think of as benefits. It is not simply money or bonuses. It is time. It is balance. It is perspective. It is other things that define an overall healthy and wealthy life, wealthy in the, in the term of wellness. 74% um, Three quarters say they're focusing more on other things than just work because COVID taught them that lesson. There's more to life. And then eight out of 10 agree being self-aware enough to deal with mental health issues will help me get ahead in the world. I think that's critically important. Eight out of 10 young people believe that finally attuning themselves to their overall mental health and wellness and well-being is not only going to define their happiness and their health is going to define their success moving forward. So very encouraging data being driven, I think, by our young people that are really creating a, a call of action uh, for business to understand and, and to act on. So real quickly to kind of finish up, just a couple of trends that Harris Poll that we're seeing in this space, um, a lot of phenomenal work just in a, in a brief a couple of minutes, I'll just kind of describe a few things that we're sort of seeing. One of the things in, in, in health and wellness that becomes so important is, is sleep. So there is this sort of sweet dreams trend that's happening right now. Uh, Casper Labs doing some really interesting things. They actually have a set of sleep scientists that are charged with understanding new sleep technology. So they're building smart mattresses, tracking devices, thinking about beds in the context of, of a sort of you know, engaging and sort of listening machine in a way that creates clocks, connected devices, medical machines can really sort of understand and, and really help process how we sleep so that we can get better sleep. Same with Eight Sleep, a really interesting startup that has smart mattresses that are building in machine learning and AI to sort of understand physical parameters like restlessness, insomnia, light sleeping. So again, they can help us uh, sort of optimize our rest. And then I love scroll by, I can't even say it the right way. How do you say lullaby and, and scroll together? <clears throat> Somebody can help me do it and do a better job. But this startup basically combats doom scrolling. You know, that thing when you sit there and start looking at your phone and that creates insomnia. What they've done is disrupted it by taking a user's social feed and pulling in digital lullabies and other soft content to sort of get you off that endless nighttime scroll. That sounds like a fun thing. Psychedelics, we could have a whole nother conversation and presentation around that, but the, the sort of plant-based world and, the, and psychedelics are being built into all kinds of new ways to deal with wellness. Just a burgeoning uh, field here. Um, interesting to see if this follows the arc of cannabis, uh, but you can start to see what's happening. There's um, luxury retreats that are doing magic mushroom offerings on spiritual health, uh, healing and metaphysical self-discovery. The California Institute of Integral Studies is actually looking at the, the actual tangible health benefits of psychedelics in their treatments. And they're looking at ways to sort of build in therapy schools into their programming. There's connection between psychedelics, and I'd have to pronounce this carefully, uh, Sila 
psilocybin, uh, which basically is an organic compound in psychedelic mushrooms and its connection to weight loss. So an interesting emerging field here in psychedelics. And then lastly, let's just look at a couple of quick examples around workplace wellness. Uh, you know, there's a lot of interesting companies that are recognizing how burned out and how stressed uh, their employees are. And so they've done great, great things. You know, Nike closed its offices for a week to give employees a mental health break. And uh, Matt, a uh, senior manager at, Mike, at Nike, said it's, it's not just a week off. It's an acknowledgement that we can prioritize mental health and still get work done. Bumble did the same thing in June, and several uh, advertising agencies are now trying to combat burnout by working remotely and offering more time off and, and other perks. So that's a real quick look at, uh, at some of our data on mental health and wellness. Um, but I'd leave you with this final thought, which is, out again, out of our work with uh, Lady Gaga's Born This Way Foundation, this really starts with kindness. Um, it starts with marketing kindness, building kindness into your business model, building kindness into the way you treat your employees, and building kindness into the way that you think about yourself uh, as an individual in this world. And I think it's a real interesting insight here in our question the percentage of people that agreed with statements about personal experience with kindness by stated mental wellness. And look at the high correlations between I'm often kind to myself, I regularly receive kindness from others, and I regularly see kindness in the world. If those things are happening to you, there's a higher correlation on stating that you have fair um, to more excellent uh, mental wellness. And I think that that becomes a really important understanding that kindness is really a first step uh, in this entire journey. So how is we as marketers can institute uh, kindness? So that's a quick look at, at our data. Happy to connect with you uh, at a later time. I hope you're enjoying today. There's just a phenomenal set of programs uh, and speakers, and uh, I'm excited to learn more. Thanks so much. Yeah. Hey, John, it's uh, Nick. And before you go, I, I, again, I just want to thank you guys uh, at the Harris Bowl and Stagwell Group for being such great partners, um, you know, as, as really since we started. Um, quick question for you. I know we actually are starting the, uh, we actually went in the field today. So if you're a CMO and you're affiliated with the ANA, you're going to get a survey about um, how you're focusing and managing your people through these issues that John just went through. And so we got a good sense because there's, you know, a good deal out there around the consumer standpoint, but when it comes to, you know, our specific industry with advertising and marketing, um, we can really only go to you guys, uh, in the industry and kind of get insights from what you're doing. So it really needs you to pay attention to that in your inboxes and, uh, you know, reply because, you know, this, to us here, as we see, is the issue and challenge, and you could say opportunity, but I think we're in the more of the challenge phase um, that is most thought about, but least talked about in our industry. And as you, if you're a CMO or you manage a, uh, a team or you're an agency executive, you've got teams that are so massively complex in your ecosystem, and they've all been head down over the last 18 months working and do it, you know, what it is that we do. So I just want to point you guys to the, uh, the poll, the, uh, the anonymous study that we're doing uh, together with the Harris poll and uh, invite anyone, you know, frankly, who has any sort of insight and experience, lessons learned uh, and expertise in this area to please let us know because the industry, you know, if, if we're not taking care of the people that are driving our industry's growth, we're not going to have sustained growth. And so we really need to make sure we get this right on all accounts, uh, you know, mind, spirit, and obviously capabilities that we talk, we're talking about today. So John, is there anything that, um, you know, you, you want to kind of highlight there with respect to the insights and the outcomes that we're looking for uh, within that poll, within that survey, they're going to be complementary to, to, to what you're talking, what you just went through. Yeah, absolutely, Nick. I mean, I think you said it really well. I think the power in this survey is that it's a peer-based survey among CMOs. And what we're really after with this ANA, um, you know, sort of Harris Poll survey is to benchmark 
what companies are doing, how they're approaching uh, taking care of their employees, how they're thinking about returning to work. There's a number of, of questions in a very brief survey. I think you can get it done in about seven minutes. Um, it is, as you say, highly confidential, and I think it will give us a really great baseline learning for a lot of discussion. Yeah, I think people just hear that, you know, mental health and wellness word, and they just kind of, you know, kind of shy away. Oh, maybe that's not me. You know, I don't have the license to, uh, you know, really be involved in that. But again, no, you know, we all manage massive teams of complicated networks. And if you guys as leaders, uh, agencies, uh, professors, students, you know, if you, if you guys as leaders are not, you know, up to speed on this, and I don't know, you know, the, really, the book has not been written yet. So we're kind of making up as we go along. Why not just make it up together and learn from each other like we do with uh, with everything else? So, like I said, it's an open, you know, open, um, you know, invite and uh, and and frankly, a call for uh, for insights uh, as we uh, as we get into this, so that we can you know just continue to um, manage into uh, whatever the next phase for us is. So, John, listen, thank you guys, thank you for your partnership, and always thank you for the uh, for the insights. Um, it's, it's just so important to be informed as we go as informed as we can as we go through the next phase thank you thanks Nick.